This is an AQA Physics GCSE talk through for the Trilogy exam board, paper 2H from June 21. Figure 1 shows a stretch spring. The spring is elastically deformed. What is meant by elastically deformed? It means that the spring will return to its original length when the force is removed. Remember, when the spring reaches its elastic limit, that's when it's been deformed and it won't go back to its original shape. So here's our answer. Describe a method to determine the extension of the spring. It's worth two marks. You want to measure the original length of the spring and then work out using the same ruler the extended length of the spring and then do extension equals extended length minus original length. The extension of the spring is 80 millimetres. The spring constant is 40 newtons per metre. Calculate the elastic potential energy of the spring. Use the physics equation sheet. So this is the equation you want to use. Be careful with your units. You want your 80 millimetres in metres by dividing by 1,000. So it becomes 0 0.08 metres. You're after the elastic potential energy of the spring. We know the spring constant is 40, multiply it by 0 0.08 squared, and then just pop all of that into your calculator to get a value of 0 0.128 joules. Write down the equation which links extension, force, and spring constant. It's up to you if you write it out in words or in letters. Force is spring constant times extension. A force of 300 newton acts on a different spring. The force causes the spring to extend by 0 0.4 meters. Calculate the spring constant of the spring. You don't have to rearrange the equation if you don't want to. That's completely up to you. And then to solve for k, divide both sides by 0 0.4. So do 300 divided by 0 0.4 to get an answer of 750. Professional rugby players wear a tracking device that measures their velocity and acceleration. Figure 2 sh shows a person wearing a tracking device. The player is tackling another player who is running with the ball. Velocity and acceleration are both vector quantities. What is a vector quantity? It's something which has both direction and magnitude. If it has magnitude only, it would be scalar. Which of the following is a vector quantity? You do need to learn these. It's actually displacement. The rest of these down here are scalar quantities. Figure three shows a velocity time graph for the player running with the ball. Determine the acceleration of the player between 0 and 1.6 seconds. So we're looking here and here. You want the gradient of this line here. So remember, gradient is change in y over change in x. So what's our change in y? 4. Our change in x is 1.6. So our answer here is 2.5 meters per second squared. Describe the motion of the player between 3.4 and 3.6 seconds. So here and here, we can see that they're decelerating, so they're slowing down and very rapidly, because look at how steep that gradient is. Because it's a straight line as well, you can say it's constant deceleration. The force exerted on the player when she's tackled causes her to accelerate. Write down the equation which links acceleration, mass and resultant force. Force equals mass times acceleration. The player accelerates at 25 meters per second squared when the resultant force of 1800 newtons acts on her. Calculate the mass of the player. So 
So substitute in your values, divide both sides by 25 to find M. So 1800 divided by 25 is 72 kilograms. The tracking device sends data to a computer during the game. So just one advantage of the data being sent during the game. Not really a physics question this, you just want to write so that the player's performance can be monitored during the game. A student made water waves in a ripple tank. Describe how the frequency and wavelength of the water waves in the ripple tank can be measured accurately. Remember the wave equation is wave speed equals frequency times wavelength, by the way. Let's start by placing a meter ruler at the side of the screen at right angles to the wave fronts. Then take a photo of the shadow produced on the screen and then use the meter ruler to measure the distance between two wave fronts and that will tell you the wavelength. So we'll write that first of all. Remember perpendicular means at right angles. Now we need to measure the frequency of the wave, which is the number of waves per second. So let's literally say that count the number of waves that pass a given point per second. So you'll need to use a stop clock to do that. The student recorded values for the frequency and wavelength of the waves in the ripple tank determine the mean wave speed. Let's start with our mean frequency, so add these up and then divide by 3 to get 9.5 as your mean frequency. Now let's find our mean wavelength, so again add these three numbers up, divide by 3. One thing to be aware of though is once you've done that, you do want to actually divide by 100 in order to change your units into metres. So once you've done that, you'll have a mean wavelength of 0 0.02 metres. So that's 0 0.19 metres per second. What is the advantage of taking repeat readings and then calculating a mean? This question comes up a lot. You can write that it reduces the effect of random errors or it means that anomalous readings can be discarded before calculating a mean. The speed of the wave is affected by the depth of the water in the ripple tank. The deeper the water, the faster the wave. Explain how the depth of the water affects the wavelength of the wave if the frequency is constant. Again, you want to use this equation to help you. If the V value changes, for example, that V value increases because it's a faster wave, and we know that the frequency is constant, what does that mean about the wavelength for these other two facts to hold true? Well, it means that the wavelength must have also increased. Always state an equation to back up your answer. Figure 4 shows the magnetic field pattern around a permanent magnet. Where is the magnetic field of the magnet the strongest? It's here at the poles. How does figure 4 show that the strength of magnetic field is not the same in all the places? Because the distance between these magnetic field lines varies. So where they're closer together, it's stronger. Figure 5 shows the electromagnetic being used to separate iron and steel from non-magnetic materials. 
We explain one reason why an electromagnet is used instead of a permanent magnet. It's so that you can turn the electromagnet on and off in terms of its magnetism because you, didn't, you wouldn't want all that scrap metal to be stuck to it permanently. You need to be able to separate all your steel and iron out from everything else. So the electromagnet is easily demagnetized, meaning you can easily separate the scrap metal. Pieces of iron and steel are attracted to the electromagnet. Name two other metals that would be attracted to the electromagnet. This is the same question as what metals are magnetic. Other examples include cobalt and nickel. The design of the electromagnet cannot be changed. Give two ways the force exerted by the electromagnet on a piece of iron or steel could be increased. These questions get asked so often. You want to increase the current in the coil of the electromagnet or in this case, bring the electromagnet closer to the pieces of iron and steel in order to increase that magnetic force. The conveyor belt that moves the pieces of metal is driven by an electric motor. Figure 6 shows a simple electric motor. The length of the wire AB in the magnetic field is 120 millimetres. Before I even read the rest of the question, I'm just going to get that into metres. There is a current of 4 amps in the wire, so that's I. The length of the wire AB experiences a force of 0.36 newtons. Calculate the magnetic flux density between the magnets. Give the unit. So the equation you need looks like this, which states that force is equal to the magnetic flux density times the current times the length. And now just make sure you're substituting everything in the right place. So after B, we know the current is 4 amps, and we know that the length of the wire is 0.12 meters. Start by doing 4 times 0.12 to get. 0.48 and then to get B by itself divide 0.36 by 0.48 so our magnetic flux density is 0.75 and our unit is Tesla. Fleming's left hand rule can be used to determine the direction of force on the YAB. Complete the labels on figure 7 to show Fleming's left hand rule. So remember your thumb, M shows the motion, the force. First finger shows the F magnetic field direction. Second finger contains the C, which means it's the direction of the current, and that's how I always remember it. Different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum are used in medical imaging. Figure eight shows an image of a person's hand taken with an infrared camera. Explain why the infrared camera is able to show the parts of the hand at different temperatures. That's because different temperatures emit different intensities of infrared. And then these are represented on the camera as different colours. Infrared has a range of wavelengths from 700 nanometers to 1 millimeter. Remember, 700 nanometers is the same as 7 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. Which part of the electromagnetic spectrum would have waves with a wavelength of 6.5 times 10 to the minus 7? This is why I've changed that unit so you can actually compare them properly so they have the same unit. Remember, in terms of the electromagnetic spectrum, it goes radio waves, microwaves, infrared radiation, visible light, ultraviolet, x-rays and gamma rays. So your longest wavelength is over here where the radio waves are and then your shorter wavelength is over here where gamma is. So if we know that infrared 
is 7 times 10 to the minus 7. We're looking for a wavelength which is shorter, it's 6.5 times 10 to the minus 7, which is why the answer here is visible light. It is not infrared microwaves or radio waves. Look, these wavelengths are too long. So I did quite a lot of work there to work that out. Figure 9 shows x-rays and gamma rays being used in medical imaging. To use x-rays for medical imaging, a machine produces a very brief burst of x-rays. To use gamma rays for medical imaging, a radioactive isotope is injected into the patient's blood. The isotope is circulated around the body in the blood. The isotope emits gamma rays. Compare the potential risk to a patient of using x-rays and gamma rays for medical imaging. Let's first of all point out that they are both types of ionizing radiation, which means they can cause mutations in cells leading to cancer. But in terms of differences, the whole body is irradiated by gamma rays because that isotope has been injected into the patient's blood, whereas with x-rays it's a lot more localised. The x-rays are only absorbed in the part of the body exposed. And then lastly, we can talk about exposure time for gamma rays because, again, it has to pass out of the body in terms of we need that isotope to decay, so your exposure time is going to be longer for gamma rays. X-rays are produced by colliding high-energy electrons into a metal target. The electrons have high energy because they're accelerated to high speeds. Only a small proportion of the kinetic energy of an electron is converted into an X-ray when it collides with the metal target. An electron is accelerated through a distance of 15 millimetres. Again, let's get that into metres. So many conversions. The work done on the electron is this. Calculate the force. So the formula triangle here is work done is force times distance. So we can see that force equals work done divided by distance. Remember, the beauty of formula triangles is that you cover what you're after and then it tells you, look, it's a divide here. So our work done was 1.2 times 10 to the minus 13 joules divided by distance 0 0.015. Put that into your calculator and get 8.0 times 10 to the minus 12 is your answer. The metal target is made from tungsten. Tungsten has the highest melting point of any metal. Explain why using tungsten as the metal target enables the X-ray machine to be more powerful. That's because when those electrons collide, it causes a heating effect which will increase the temperature and therefore if you use tungsten which has such a high melting point it does mean that more electrons can be collided per second compared with using any other type of metal. Scientists are developing a hypersonic aeroplane that will travel much faster than normal aeroplanes. An aeroplane accelerates from a low speed to a high speed with the engines at maximum power. Explain why the acceleration is not constant. Let's think about the forces acting on the plane. So at maximum power, the forward force on the engines is going to be constant. And remember, as it accelerates, more air particles are hitting per second 
and that air resistance is acting in the opposite direction and it will increase as the plane accelerates. Now the resultant force will be the difference between the force on the engine subtracted by the air resistance and therefore over time that resultant force will decrease. And then finally you need to mention that acceleration is directly proportional to that resultant force. This is a very hard question. So at maximum power, the forward force of the engines is constant as the plane accelerates the air resistance increases for me this is the most straightforward mark to get then we're pointing out what that resultant force will be made up of so it equals the force from the engine minus the air resistance and then because the air resistance increases we know that that resultant force will decrease and the acceleration is directly proportional to the resultant force. The hypersonic aeroplane will have jet engines and a rocket engine. The speed of aeroplanes can be measured on a uniform scale known as the Mach scale. Mach 1 equals 330 meters per second. The jet engines will accelerate the aeroplane to Mach 5.5. The rocket engine will accelerate the aeroplane from Mach 5.5 to Mach 25.5 in 300 seconds. So there's a time value. Let's get that Mach into something we understand in terms of meters per second. So do 5.5 times 330 to get something tangible. So that's going to be 1,815 meters per second and Mach 25.5 is 8,415 meters per second. The average resultant force on the airplane when the rocket engine is used is 630,000 newtons. So there's a force value. Calculate the mass of the hypersonic airplane. Give your answer to two significant figures. It's worth six marks. Right, let's get into this. So we know we have to find the mass. We've got a force. So this equation is going to be important, which is force equals mass times acceleration. However, we don't have enough information yet to use that. We need to find the acceleration, which we can find over here because we have an initial speed, we have a final speed, and we have a time value. So remember, acceleration equals final speed minus initial speed over time. So let's start using that equation. So our final speed is, is 8,415, our initial speed is 1,815, divided by our time value, which is 300 seconds, to get an acceleration of 22 meters per second squared. And then we can use this equation to find the mass. So 630,000 newtons equals what we're looking for times 22. So our mass is divide 630,000 by 22 to get this gross looking number. But then our final answer needs to be two sig fig. So just round that to 29,000 kilograms. Ta-da, and that is done.